Buy my novel, Escape from the Village, from major booksellers online. Go to escapevillage.com. Subscribe to my Substack. Go to fountainheadforum.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome to the party, pal. This is Fountainhead Forum 102. I have her Vohe Morich. Uh, he's a uh, does he's on TNT Radio. He does the Geopolitics and Empire podcast. Uh, he was born in Chicago. He spent some time going back and forth between there and Croatia, and now he lives in Mexico. We're going to talk about Croatia, the general state of the world, and other things. How are you, Avore? I'm doing uh, well. Nice to see you virtually. Uh, we met. It was only yes. what, I think three months ago uh, out in Houston at the Ron Paul conference. Uh, so was, I think it was more like ten months ago, but yeah, we met him at the Ron Paul conference. Yeah, it's uh, not that far for not that far for each of us. I doesn't look like they're doing an event this year, unfortunately, either. Which is, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I went to George Gammon's Rebel Capitalist event one time, and it was in Houston. And I, 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 I kind of whispered to George. I said, "George, you had this here just for Ron Paul, didn't you?" He said, "Yes," because <laughs> he figured, you know. You know, you might not get Ron Paul to go a hundred, a thousand miles, but you can get Ron Paul to go twenty or thirty miles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, George does just, great work. Yeah. Just send a limo and pick him up, and then send the limo back to drop him off, and there you go. It's not hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Carol Paul was Carol Paul is often with him too at his appearances. I assume she gets in free with him. So yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh, they used to have a few birthday parties for him, but that hasn't happened in a while either. I, Anyway, so how did you get into all of this? Basically, uh, you know, just quick history. I did my undergrad in Illinois in history education, and then I decided to escape forever America, the American Empire, and my ticket out was Peace Corps Mongolia. So 2006, I lived in a yurt in the Gobi Desert. Uh, when I came back, I was soul-searching and ended up getting into international relations. So I did my master's in Geneva, Switzerland, the Geneva School of Diplomacy. And then right after that, I looked for a job anywhere in the world uh, and got hired at the Tecnologico de Monterrey, the MIT uh, of, of Mexico, Monterrey Institute of, of Technology. In hindsight, I realized that it's a full-on globalist institution. It's officially linked with World Economic Forum. Um, and so I, I, got, I worked there from 2010 to 2017 uh, and then as soon as I started teaching at the high school and university in Mexico, I kind of got bored. I wanted no one around me wanted to talk about the subjects we talk about. So I had to figure out a way um, to get some, you know, intellectual, how do you say, satisfaction or something. And I just started asking some folks to, 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 to Skype them in. I figured I'd Skype them into my classroom. Uh, and then throw it up on YouTube. So I, I, I managed to get people like Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. And this is like 20, I think 2012. So uh, 11 years ago, Ray McGovern, retired CIA, James Bamford, uh, Lord Christopher Moncton, you know, people like Robert Pastor, the father of the North American Union. That's kind of how it started. So it was just like a, I was just throwing this stuff up on YouTube. And then 2015, 16, I said I should do like a proper podcast. So that's kind of when it, I was it was rebranded as Geopolitics and Empire. Uh, yeah. And then I, I went off to live in Kazakhstan from 2017 to 2020. And then uh, I got hired to do TNT Radio last year. So, yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah, I think you're probably the first Peace Corps person I've ha had on here. And you ended up in Mongolia, which I've actually been to. So you, so you've been to Mongolia? Uh, yeah, I was there for the Liberty International Conference in Ulaanbaatar back in 2019. The Liberty uh, International? Very, yeah, very, very interesting country. Uh, oh, I love it. Mongolia is amazing. Well, Mo Mongolia is the lowest population density in the world. Uh, you know, it, it's got the same population as Utah, and it's about seven times the land area. And, and about half the people in Mongolia live in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, and I'll say this too. I saw, I saw cranes everywhere in Ulaanbaatar. They were really building up. And the other, yeah, that was, that, that was that was yeah. what seven years after I left. But yeah, spot on. They've got the lowest population density, three to four million people. I think. Uh, I think it's like if they stretch people out, it's like one person per yeah. mile uh, or something like that. There's the, uh, there's like twenty five million sheep. So <laughs> yeah, and I also know it, it also has become. Uh, it also it seems to become a popular destination for North Korean defects too. I, 
I saw a lot of, I saw maybe a dozen Korean restaurants there. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd say there's South Korean. There's a number of South Koreans. Well, there. The, the hostel where I used to stay all the time in Lombard yeah. was run by South Koreans. So. Well, there, I don't think there's many Koreans who want to get out of South Korea as North Korea. So, uh, you know, and, and the Chinese don't, and, and they can get to China, but China doesn't treat them very well. So where do you go from there? I said, okay, try Mongolia, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, because that when you see when you see those kind of restaurants, it's almost always immigrants who. That's the great thing about immigrants; they open restaurants. Yeah, I mean, I came across you know Malaysians, uh, all sorts of folks. Uh, yeah. um, but the great thing about Mongolia for me is one of the few places I mean that that I've traveled so far where you can sort of still live like without all of this digital stuff. You can just completely disregard. You know, go, there are places where you can go where it's all. It's like you're living, you know, uh, a thousand years ago. So that, that's what I absolutely love about Mongolia. I, I remember it also, it seemed like when I got off the plane there, it seemed like, you know, I've always, you know, once the plane lands, you're, you're going down the runway at like five miles an hour. What is the reason for keeping your seatbelt on? And I noticed a lot of the Mongolians, it seemed like they were already starting to take off their seatbelts. I'm just like, oh, they're disobeying unnecessary, stupid rules. Good for them. <laughs> you know, just taking off the seatbelt. But it's like, you know, it's not, nobody's going to get hurt when the when the airplane is taxiing on the runway. It's like, but anyway. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I definitely found, and, and I also appreciate that it's definitely more of a basketball country than a soccer country. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, so, so good for them. It's, does it get pretty cold there? Oh yeah, Ulaanbaatar is the coldest capital on the planet, and um, yeah, I mean, I lived in the year it's like minus thirty Celsius or whatever, minus twenty, minus thirty, minus forty can be, uh, you know. But you you get used to it. I don't like I I, I enjoyed it. So. Yeah, yeah, you must because Peace Corps is usually two years. Yeah, I did only one a little over uh, a year. Right. I I left early. Um, I was just kind of young and and uh, what do you call it? Um, just, you know, young for no particular reasons <laughs> but yeah that's uh but it, it does give you it does give you an interesting experience so you probably learned so you've got english croatian mongolian at the time in six months i've, I've got the test I, I in six months i became intermediate uh in in mongolian but as ever since you know when you leave there's no one to speak with and so yeah. i lost most of the i'm pretty sure i've had a dream where i go back to mongolia um and then in Ulaanbaatar, I stay for a month and do crash course, you know, everyday language lessons to bring it right back up and then go back to the village where I used to live. Because I still talk to some of the folks on Facebook. They tell me, come back, visit us in Mongolia uh, and to surprise them and, and you know, speak with them in Mongolian. So but yeah, so um, I've forgotten a lot of that. So I'm, I'm fluent in Spanish. Yeah, that's as well one of the one of the smallest airports I've been into. Only four gates. Genghis Khan Airport. Yeah, four gates. That was uh, that and. That and Iquitos in Peru, four gates. That was, I, I've not been to a smaller airport than that, but yeah, it's a yeah. So you and then you, and what were you doing in Kazakhstan? Which isn't. I got hired to teach 2017. Same thing I was doing in Mexico. So Nazar yeah. Nur, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who was president for like 30 years from 1990 to yeah. 2018. Um, he cre in 2009 he created the Nazarbayev University, like to create a you know world class university. It's 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 good. Yeah. Um, that, that's where Xi Jinping in 2013 uh, announced Belt and Road at the Naz Nazarbayev University. Yeah. And then he also created these Nazarbayev intellectual schools, secondary schools, where uh, there's 20 of them now around Kazakhstan. Um, and they're trilingual, English, Russian, and Kazakh. And I was hired to teach at the Nazarbayev intellectual school in Semey, Semipalatinsk, which is the dissident city of the Russian Empire, Soviet Union, um, Kazakhstan. You know, that's where the Russian Empire sent Dostoevsky in exile for five years i have visited his, yeah. his old home in Semey, um and it's 100 kilometers from the polygon the principal soviet nuclear test site where stalin dropped the first bomb in 49 and i actually got it's an 18,000 square kilometer um uh, test site the polygon and so i was living mm -hmm. 100 kilometers from there and before i left i actually got to go into the polygon do a tour um and i visited one of the ground zeros so where a nuke actually <laughs> uh dropped so that was quite fascinating yeah, yeah, that's a 
Yeah, you never learned Kazakh or never had to? Or No, I'm in Kazakh. I, at that point, I was I was able to get by with Russian because Croatia, okay. Croatian and Russian have the same roots. Uh, so it's like 50% of the language is the same. So I, I got by with broken Russian. How, yeah, how easy, you know, I didn't, uh, based on my, I, I was with a, a group in Mongolia where everything's basically taken care of. I didn't really get the impression it would be that easy, easy to get around there as an English speaker. I mean, I had locals, but I don't know if I'd go to, I don't know if I'd go to Kazakhstan or or Mongolia by myself. I, yeah, not not many people uh, speak English. And you, and you you do have to you know watch out. The taxis will rip you off like uh, crazy. They tried yeah. it uh, with me, and you know little things like uh, that. But yeah, you you've kind of got a look that would kind of fit in everywhere too, though. I mean, you you, you could pass off as being a Central Asian. It's, or, or well, maybe. hey, they, they thought my wife was Indian. There's a lot of Indians in Kazakhstan, so. You know, there's a lot of Indians everywhere because there are a lot of Indians. But yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah, Kazakhstan. Yeah, and Kazakhstan's another. Uh, what's going on in Kazakhstan right now? Are you paying any attention to that or? Not lately, that? but uh, I can tell you some interesting stories. So I went there 2017, and my master's thesis in, in Geneva was yeah. on color revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, and I even traced the back, uh, you know, everyone talks about, you know, one of the first color revolutions was 2000 in Serbia and then 2003, Georgia, the Rose Revolution, 2004, the Ukraine uh, Orange Revolution, so Lebanon was a Sapphire Revolution, all these f funky names, Iran in 2008. Well, they've got to come up with a new color every time. Right. Um, Myanmar, whatever. Um, but and it's the, the same formula, National Endowment for Democracy, Open, <laughs> open Society. Um, USAID. And so when I was doing my master's, it's interesting in Mongolia, uh, you know, in Saakashvili in Georgia, uh, the Open Society financed Saakashvili to create a Liberty Institute. In the yeah. early 90s, Mongolia was, you know, James Baker, USAID came in. I forget, I think it's Elbeg Doric, the former president, but when he was young, Elbeg Doric in the 90s, he created a Liberty Institute fi financed by the Open Society. So again, even in the early 90s, the color revolution framework was uh, active. And then I think in 96, Mongolia had some sort of, um, I think it was called the Red Rose Revolution. But anyways, um, Kazakhstan. So what happened was I was warning in 2017. I, I, one of my students, uh, you know, they, they, they talk with me. I had a very smart Kazakh student. We talk after uh, classes. And she was really uh, interested in uh, everything that's going on in the world. She was participating in extracurricular activities with some NGO in Kazakhstan. And she showed me a certificate that she got. And it was all in Cyrillic. I can read Cyrillic. And at yes. the bottom, it said National Endowment for Democracy. And my eyes just went, what? And I told her, what's the name of this NGO? I went to their website. And they're present all over uh, Kazakhstan. And... Uh, I went to their website, sure enough, at the bottom it says, financed by USAID, Open Society, National Endowment. And so then I started telling, I told my superiors at the school, like, hey, look what's, you know, I'm concerned as an American yeah. that the American empire is working to regime change Kazakhstan. And things are quite, you know, the, the, the Kazakhstan is authoritarian light. Um, yeah. It's it's a police state light. A lot of people are connected and pretty soon i got visited by the head of the internal security uh in the city and who's my who's my age speaks fluent english she studied they've got a great program where kazakhs can get a scholarship to go do graduate studies abroad so this guy studied like in uk he took me out uh to lunch and it felt like a scene from a movie where the you know the the, the former soviet uh, you're in this former Soviet country, and there he takes you out to lunch. You're having a nice discussion, but at the same time, he's like vetting you. He must be thinking, "Who is this guy? He's got three passports. Is he CIA?" Uh, but I was just earnestly trying to warn him. Look, I see signs that they might regime change, do a color revolution in Kazakhstan. So that was 2017, 18, 19, 20, and then in January of 2022, last year, if you recall. There was this event uh, in um, Astana, Astana, Nur Sultan, Astana. They changed the name for like a few years. Uh, it's back to Astana, I believe, the capital. Is that where, in Kazakhstan? Yeah. Yeah, the capital of Kazakhstan. Can you spell that, please? 
A well now it's A S T A N A Astana. They changed okay. it to Nur Sultan and trying they tried to name it after Nazarbayev, but I they changed it back again. Well, just if, anybody a lot of wants, favor. if anybody wants to look it up, they can look it up. Yeah. Astana. But but what happened was it would seem it seemed like their people got together like they were attempting uh, a coup and that was put down. So it seems like that was a failed color revolution, just as I was uh, predicting. Yeah. Uh, a later later a friend of mine tells me that the KNB which is the Kazakh CIA intelligence service. They were calling some of the people that I knew over there asking about me. Uh, and I'm like, well, hey, you know, they can talk to me if they want to talk to me. I, I, you know, I'm happy to uh, talk. I, did, I didn't do anything wrong. And so, um, but right now, Tokayev is the president. Uh, by the way, Tokayev was the honorary dean at my alma mater, the Geneva School of Diplomacy, because he used to work in Geneva at the UN. So it's funny how I get, uh, you know, it's a small world, but well, it seems it, like, yeah, uh -huh. there's long been a lot of interconnection between these uh, academics at all these so-called elite schools. Well, Kim Jong-un, I learned when I was in Geneva, yeah. Lausanne, which is not far from Geneva, he went to boarding like high school in Lausanne, Kim Jong-un, North Korea. So, you know, it's just like, you know, it makes you think about all of these uh, elites. But, uh, you know, Kazakhstan has had this multi-vector, what did they say, foreign policy where they try to work with everyone. But then, you know, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that are covered up when you learn that, you know, the economically the biggest presence by far is the U.S. There's like 500 American companies. They're extracting the oil. Yeah. So you see this kind of facade of Cold War in the news. Yeah. Really behind the scenes, it's like all these globalist elites that are friendly with each other. I used to have a friend that worked out, a cousin, out, out in Sakhalinsk, Russia, and when I, you know, in the Russian oil industry, yeah. and my cousin told me, like, I'm, I asked him, "What's your opinion of this Cold War?" This was before, you know, this was like way back in, two, in the 2000 teens, and he tells me, you know, all that stuff you see in the news, you know, Russia, U.S. Behind the scenes, the American and Russian and European businessmen are all just making insane piles of money. Yeah. So it's 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 interesting to hear those on the ground things. But it seems yeah. like to, uh, Kazakhstan, it's really in the middle. Uh, it, it's I, I feel like it's it's they're hedging their bets. It seems they don't know who to side with, and it it, it, it seems like they're not keen on siding with Russia, uh, and that they're 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 like in between, oscillating between east and west. Uh, but it still seems like they're slightly leaning towards the West uh, as well. They might be afraid of Washington. I don't know. Well, well, yeah, Kazakhstan, I, I know there's a lot. I believe Kazakhstan was the last country uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union to declare independence. So they were very, and I know they have a large, uh, still a pretty large Russian speaking minority there. It's like 20%. Yeah. And, and not to mention, I, 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 that's also one of the longest borders in the world. Yeah, I mean, K country. Kazakhstan, I believe, is the tenth largest country by land area. It's like it's that. a huge country too, although I mean, it's a lot bigger than Ukraine, and I think it's, uh, and yet it 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 also only has about twenty million people, so a lot of it's just desert as well, right? Yeah, you you know your geography history. So yeah, it's about 18, 20 million uh, people. Um, desert, yeah, yes. part, parts it's yes. desert, part step. Uh, and and so forth. Forests, yeah. Oh, and, and I gotta ask, what did they think of Borat? Well, mixed feelings. Um, yeah. Some people, I, I mean, that was a long time ago, so some yeah. people don't even know. Um, some yeah. Kazakhs, others are angry. Yeah, I've had other Kazakhs tell me that it was great. It put Kazakhstan on the map. So yeah, yeah. There, well, I, I have to ask, how many how many Americans before that movie even knew that the country existed? I, I, I that that was the first thing I'm thinking. None of, so you know, it's, you know, it's, some of them probably wondered, is that really a country or, or not? You know, because there was actually some kind of invasion. There was actually some invasion or something like a month before, before Ukraine. Uh, it was in January of 2022. They did something there, the Russians, and there were some protests there. And you know, I, that, I got that's the what I was referring to right January yeah, 2022. You know, I also got the impression that some of those protests were actually against some of the ridiculous corona policies is that correct or not i mean at that at the time that was what people were discussing i don't think that was the case yeah. um part of it was people were complaining about high energy prices some oh, yeah. 
the Corona stuff, I don't, I don't think, because I, I was there when Corona happened. It was absolutely insane. It was total like dystopia. Um, oh yeah. I, my, my view is, you know, COVID was um, that there, you know, it it wasn't by definition a pandemic, and the purpose of it was uh, like Power Kennedy grab, said, yeah. this was a CIA operation uh, How- to, to install How- this dig- digital technocracy. Yeah. And uh, they gave us a card when COVID happened. So this was 2020 spring. The government issued everyone a card that said, you know, you can only leave your home every other day. So it's like literally one day you're literally locked into your house. Literally, you cannot leave. And only the next day, one person with the card can leave the home to go to the supermarket, bank or pharmacy. There's police patrols that in, in trios. They're walking around uh, car patrols. And and um, it, it's absolutely insane. Like, what about other stuff? My kid didn't have shoes. She was growing quickly. And it was like, literally, she had no shoes. We can't go buy shoes. What is this? Public health, right? Well, my kid's got no shoes. It's cold outside. What am I supposed to yeah. do? And so it's it's for your safety, right? And a lot of yeah. Kazakhs, they didn't buy this because they lived under tyranny and totalitarianism. So their attitude was, this is all BS. But they didn't have that attitude of rebelling. You see what I'm saying? They don't, so they don't know. They, they they don't understand. Know. Yeah, they don't they've know anything under, else. Yeah, they've been under tyranny. So they're like, this is all BS. We don't believe this, but um, we're just going to keep our heads down and hope we don't get clobbered on the head. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. They, they don't know anything else. It's weird. Uh, yeah. And and I assume also Kazakhstan probably gets pretty cold too, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It was just like Mongolia, minus 30. And usually in like February, it gets so cold, they mm-hmm. cancel uh, cl- school classes for a week because it's just so cold. Yeah. You know. uh, did you get into the? Did you get into any of the other uh, Central Asian countries by chance? Uh, I was actually planning a trip: Kyrgyzstan, was, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan. No, but I, I I had planned a trip to North Korea in 2018. Uh, it's, for, for people that don't, I was in the process of planning it, but for personal reasons, my wife had a uh, she was pregnant and she she went back to Mexico, but she had a slight complication and for that reason i don't want to go but uh as a u.s citizen you cannot go to north korea officially the state department says you cannot go to north korea on a u.s passport they don't say u.s citizens cannot go they say you can't go to north korea on a u.s passport well fair enough i've got a croatian passport and a mexican passport so um i can fully legally go to north korea and and i forget the name there are tour companies that you pay they they organize everything you get your korean north korean visa at chinese embassies um so uh after, that would have been cool to go after after auto warmbler i can't understand why anybody would go there i i just can't uh but anyway. I, i'd still i'd still go yeah just you know follow the the the, the rules don't do anything you're not supposed to so well I- what he did was pretty, what he allegedly did was pretty innocuous, but yeah, I, it just seems like a risk I don't want to take. I, 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 in fact, when I was flying back from Mongolia, I changed planes in Beijing and how many times I was asked for my passport, what, five or six times said, no, I'm not changing planes here again. Forget it. Bye-bye China. But anyway, yeah. So yeah, I just wondered if you had any experience with the stun since we don't really hear much about those, but Kazakhstan being a, uh, you can get a border on the Caspian Sea and and it almost has a border with Mongolia, but not quite comes close, but doesn't. And, and they moved the capital because the capital was Almaty for a long time, right? Yeah, that's a wonderful city, beautiful city, uh, Almaty. So, uh, yeah, it used to be on Almaty. Uh, yeah, it's a great country to visit if you can, Kazakhstan. Uh, that might be interesting to visit. I, I got asked too for beauty. Did you ever, not, not in these countries, did you ever make it to Lake Baikal? Mm, no. I did not. Oh, too bad. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard that is absolutely amazing to see if you, that's in Russia, North of Mongolia, but it's also, it's also one of the most voluminous lakes in the world. Cause it's, it's really deep. It's got a lot of water. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so you ended up in the stones for a while. Uh, that, that university you said MIT, is that like, like an MIT? I mean, not just the initials, but it's like an MIT. It's like in, a school in Mexico, where all the Mexican mean? nerds go. Yeah. Uh, they well, it's Monterey Institute of Technology. I think it's kind of like MIT, but it's yeah. I think it's modeled. I think it was created in 1943 by yeah. a Mexican businessman. They, they, I think they kind of modeled it in MIT, and okay. they have an a, association uh, mm-hmm. um, or link to 
yeah. uh, MIT, but I said they're, they're full on globalist. Uh, actually, the tech demo today is owned, I think, by this corporate conglomerate now called FEMSA. And FEMSA yeah. is an ofi officially uh, linked to World Economic Forum. And you can see from some of the speakers we get, you know, 10 years ago when I was there, Al Gore came to speak on campus. They paid him like 200 grand. And then during Corona, the age of Corona, they, you know, they canceled a lot of in-person classes. They had the online graduation ceremony and they had Hillary Clinton speak one year during Corona and Bill Gates speak. So that kind of really tells you. And, this, you know, that's where all the Mexican millionaires sell the, send their kids to, to, to study. They okay, got 30, yeah. they got 30 yeah. campuses all over uh, Mexico. I've heard though that Guadalajara is actually kind of the the, the tech hub of Mexico. It's like the Silicon Valley of, of Mexico, although Nuevo, uh, Monterrey, now Nuevo León. Sam Garcia, the governor of Nuevo León, this guy's nuts, full-on globalist, he's absolutely insane maniac. My opinion, nuts, globalist. No. He's come out and said, we want to uh, get rid of all private vehicles. He goes, he went to Davos. He was kissing Klaus Schwab's butt, literally. It took a photo with him, invited him back to Nuevo León. And he, he's even said stuff. He tried to pass a law, uh, an, an article in the state constitution a few years ago where he said, if you make fun of me, like if you insult him on social media, uh, it's like that Venezuela meme, straight to jail, straight to jail, 36 hours jail and a fine just for making fun of him on social media. Um, that, that was rescinded. Uh, but that tells you like, uh, anyways, Nuevo Leon is they're bringing in Tesla factories. Uh, and so it's like between Guadalajara and, and Monterrey, you know, I, you know, I, I really do. I, I definitely absolutely positively think they want to get people. Out. I think that they've been wanting to get people out of cars for a long time. And, and, and it's not hard to figure out why. And the reason why is the car represents autonomy. Yeah, exactly. I can come and I can come and go as I please. I can go where I want to go. I can, I can leave now. I can leave five minutes later. Nobody can, if I, if I decide at the last minute, I want to go 10, I want to go later. I can go later. I mean, it's, it's perfect autonomy and it's, uh, it, you know, and they're they're already doing things. Uh, I mean, look what they're you know, doing. You know, let's 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 go on record and say we are not opposed to technology. I mean, I love right. computers. I love all this stuff, but it's very troubling to see that all of these uh, and see how all of this is happening. Uh, I mean, look, look at UK. This is absolutely insane. That's one of the ground zeroes, ULEs, ultra low emission emission zones. So they're installing in front of people's homes, in residential areas, like cameras. Where so now daily, if you if you're in a, a Brit, you drive your car off the driveway to go to the supermarket every day. Any anytime you 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 leave with your car, they're gonna charge you automatically yeah. twelve pounds uh, every day. Every time you leave, it's absolutely crazy. People are smashing these things, and now in the UK they propose uh, if you don't, you know, they're getting rid of the the hydrocarbon energy. Like if you got gas yeah. boilers and stuff, and they're saying you, you know you're gonna have to install all this crazy stuff that we demand that can cost tens of thousands of dollars that you can't afford because the purpose is to bring in neo feudalism to wipe yeah. out the middle class and to bring in a feudal society. And the UK they proposed last week. Well, they said if you don't install this stuff that we tell you, one year jail or fifteen thousand uh, pound fine, uh, absolutely crazy. And here in Guadalajara, where I am. When I came back, I discovered the actual white papers here on the Mexican government website. This is no conspiracy theory. I, I got the documents, and it says that Guadalajara is a smart city. It's an, a resilient city. And I, I, I didn't know what a resilient city was, and I researched it, and I found the documents in, in Spanish. It says resilience, the Guadalajara resilient city is financed by the Rockefeller Foundation. And then they talk about cash. They want to get rid of cash, make a cashless system here. Pre-crime, it actually says. And um, and then when I came back in Corona, they were building out massive public transport infrastructure. And I was shocked because I was here since 2010. I'm like, they never did anything like this. They don't have the money for this. Where's it coming from? It's coming from the globalist Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah, and we, why, are they, why are they building out public transport? It's because they want you to get rid of, they're going to get rid of the cars or they're going to tax you out of uh, being able to own a car. And they're going to say, look, well, you got this public transport. You don't need a car anymore. Well, well, several things I've noticed, and this is one thing. If you look, if you look it up, you know, you know, let, for example, go back fifty years ago. You, you might, the average American would have to work X number of hours to buy a TV set. 
And, and look at, for example, how many hours, you know, you had to work to go buy a car. Look at that now. It's higher. Uh, I mean, cars have definitely gotten more expensive. A t TV, by the way, for example, TVs, they've went way down. Uh, and and, and as, you, as I've often pointed out, at least in America, most of the things we buy have gotten cheaper, but the things that have gotten more expensive are housing, cars, college, healthcare. And those things are such a big part that they've actually, in some ways, counterset all these other things that are cheap. Well, now they're going after for food and energy yeah. now going to be expensive. Yeah. And, you know, the, the TVs, that's part of the SOMA, yeah. like in Brave New World. That's the drug. So yeah, but, keep those cheap but, so people can be hypnotized. I was but, reading in Croatia. They just The article just came out like this week in Croatia. It says that young, young families yeah. now, young Croatians cannot make ends meet. They're not starting families. They're not getting married because they literally cannot afford. Uh, there's no affordable rent or even yeah. homes to purchase. And this is across the globe. I was saying the you know, but you know, but you go back to the fifties and sixties, people would finance TVs like they finance a car, and and you know, and and and, and one house had one TV. N nowadays, you know, a house might have four or five TVs. That's all I'm saying. I don't have a TV. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot. Well, yeah, but you've got a computer though. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that have changed for for better or for worse. Uh, and I do, and you know, the other thing that I find interesting also is they've just they've changed cars and regulated them ridiculously so much. You know, there was talk about you know, oh, there's there's a problem with cars because they need chips. Fifty years ago, cars didn't have all these chips. Why do they need all these chips? Control, because uh, you know they're I mean, moving you know, towards that the electric vehicle stuff. Uh, the, well, the, the whole reason is for that, so they can remotely shut you off. They can yeah. limit the distance you go and so forth. That 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 will that those things will almost inevitably be hacked. I, I mean, I I don't see how that that'll be. Maybe yeah, I don't see how people. I think the biggest concern is there is that the government can limit yeah. the distance that you can go, uh, and they can remotely yeah. um, shut you off. And regarding the uh, like, you know, last year or no, was it this year? This year was the very first time ever in Mexico that I had to. I was f obligated to do the vehicle emissions. So they, on the news, they were going crazy that you're going to be fine now. It's never happened before. So it's just like you say, all these different regulations. You got to pay these increasing car yes. taxes every year. Now you got to do the vehicle emissions check. You know, next year they might raise the emissions uh, or lower the emissions limit. And yeah. then your car is just illegal. They did that in California to like 70,000 trucks. They just said any semis before 2010 are illegal now. Yeah. All, yeah. all you yeah. truckers who spend all your life you know saving up to buy your hundred thousand dollar semi sorry <laughs> yeah exactly i know it's it's so ridiculous that well and you know also uh some of these things are regulated on but you know like uh and this is a problem in the west in general is there's a lot of what i call superficial prosperity uh things like uh, replacing, you know, you know, you know, when I was in school, we had the, you know, the pencil sharpener that you turn like this. Now they're electric pencil sharpeners or, or, you know, electric can openers, can openers versus just a regular manual can opener. And, and one thing pet peeve of mine is just power windows on cars. I hung on, I hung on to my 2005 echo. It was over 290,000 miles. And that was because it didn't have anything on it that I don't need. I, I got a car now that every time I, every time I put a bag of groceries on the passenger seat, some little alarm goes off and says, your the seatbelt's not buckled because there's weight on the seat. It thinks, Oh, he better buckle the seatbelt. So now I buckle the seatbelt and it never gets unbuckled. No. Yeah. And the power and, window. And I, I don't, I never wanted that. I don't need that. And, it, it, you know. and even the power windows, how many times have I had a car where they, um, they oh, get yeah. stuck, they break. And it's just the, the, the old fashioned ones that the the the, the, the yeah. they, that never happens. And you know. also, and also, if you're in a, and if you're in a situation, sometimes you're in a situation where they can shorten you can't you can't get out of the car. Uh, a, a water situation, especially, would be bad. We had not someone likely, not we, likely we, but you know, you know, get, I've also I've also got this little thing that now sends alert. Oh, your tire! One of your tires is low. Here's what scan it. It doesn't tell me which one. It just tells me as one of your tires is low. Completely worthless. I don't need that at all. I, I did just fine on my previous car. Sometimes I notice, oh, geez, that tire looks like it's a little bit low. I'd see what just happened to see it with my eyes. 
Maybe I should fill it up. Okay. Actually, two up. weeks ago here in Mexico, yeah. we get wait, here we get these massive rains, uh, and yeah. the infrastructure sucks. Um, the, the the government hasn't built it out for the, these massive rains, yeah. and there are some underpasses where they literally get flooded, and, and two people died two weeks ago. It was an eighty year old man and his nurse. They were in the car in the underpass. I, I don't know how they got themselves in the situation, but the water just went above their car and they drowned in the car and again maybe it was electric and they were an underpass able, wow. and it, they weren't able to lower the window because you know the water killed the electricity and uh yeah they died so that's i can't believe that much water accumulating in an underpass though that's that had to be very how it is here, yeah. although although they don't they don't do much better in texas uh you know but usually they they try to you know make roads so that the water will drain off of them so water doesn't accumulate i mean uh, the, the brilliant road engineers in, in Texas, of course, they, they don't put crowns in the roads in Texas. You know, you, you know, and in, in, in states where they have common sense, you know, you put a crown on the road. So the middle of the road is about six inches higher than the, than the, than both sides. So when the water comes on, you know, it just kind of rolls off. Same reason why you should never put a flat roof on a building. You know, you put it, you put a roof like this on the building. So, you know, a gable roof. So the water just rolls right off, but no, Texas doesn't have, Texas doesn't have enough sense to do that. The roads are flat in Texas, so water just stands there. Don't, don't, yeah, don't get me started. I, I don't, I don't know if any other states that's stupid or not, but yeah, yeah, I, I see standing water on the roads in Texas all the time. It's, and there's, and, and and I don't think it can cost that much to do it right, but oh well. Yeah, so uh, you know, uh, this is one reason why I'm a little more optimistic about Mexico because Mexico is still very much a cash society and. Uh, I mean, still a lot of people live off of cash and don't really ever use credit cards or may not even have banks. I'm, I mean, yes and no. I'm more, I don't even use the term black pilled anymore. I'm cyanide pilled, uh, as a legal man would call it. I, I had him on my TNT radio show recently. Um, legal man from Jones Plantation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, okay. he's been he's been on my T. I was in, I think that was okay, his, yeah. he's been on my podcast. That was his third appearance on my TNT show. Okay, recently. yeah, yeah. Okay. He, he, great film, Jones Plantation. Um, okay, yes, I've seen it too. Yes, he thanks. says he's cyanide pilled. Uh, I'd agree with him. My thing is, yes, cash is more used here than let's say U.S. U.S. and elsewhere. By the way, when I was in my recent journeys in the U.S. right now, literally now twenty five percent of the places I go don't accept cash. I was in D.C. by the National Mall got a coffee they're like no cash there's no cash option you got to use your card and i almost i only use cash and what i got like two cards one of them uh gets blocked most of the time and then it's down to like one card maybe it works maybe it doesn't and then at the airports in texas and dc it's like getting food or coffee at least a third of the places no more cash on the plane in united i sit down they're like two options to buy food or drinks the United app, which you got to download before you get on the plane, or PayPal. Uh, and I'm like, oh, great. The Department of Homeland Security banned me from PayPal last year. Social credit system. How's that? I can't buy or sell now. And so Mexico, um, my thing is that the, we've got this technology where we saw with COVID now, the mayors and governors can just tomorrow say, cash is illegal. Everyone's got to use the QR codes. You know, they tried that during COVID in 2020 in Mexico City. They said everyone's got to use QR code scanning to enter any establishment. At that point, you know, after a week, Mexicans in Mexico City weren't doing it. They weren't complying. So the mayor of Mexico City is like, OK, just kidding. We're not doing it anymore. But you, I'm seeing more and more here. People are just using nonstop apps. They're buying everything on Amazon, online apps. Um, and I had someone told me last weekend their their friend has to go to the bank for business reasons and exchange uh, coins and the banks increasingly they, they said no we're not the coin you know to exchange their coins for bills and they're like no we don't have it we're, we're not doing it so they've they're, they're carrying less and less cash uh some of the banks here have even said they're they're doing something new where they're not going to be open every day yeah. they're gonna well, they're only going to be open one week monday wednesday friday and then the subsequent week tuesday thursday so you see they're really shrinking the um, the bank presence. So it's basically it's going to shrink until it's only your phone. And then two, 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 three years ago, Mexico made the rule to access your bank account on your computer or phone. You must turn on geolocation. So they know where you are. And if you don't, you, 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 you cannot access your uh, account 
Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think this stuff can come in quickly here. We had governors all over the place in Mexico um, impose the COVID digital passport where you literally couldn't go into the supermarket or bank unless you were vaccinated. Uh, and so in, in one in uh, in one state, 500 people got injunctions because that was illegal and inconstitutional, unconstitutional. So after like 500 people got injunctions with which, you know, then they can enter the establishments, the, the governor said, Okay, we're rescinding the insane COVID. Yeah, that's that's uh, uh, yeah. You know, I suppose I suppose Jalisco is as bad as any place, right? Yeah, Which the is governor Al- Alfaro. Is, I, I call him Enrique Alfaro. I call him Enrique Adolfo Alfaro, like yeah, well, as a reference to Hitler, because yeah. you know they were lo- they were making these rules mandatory. They were floating ideas. Like one idea was, if you left the state of Jalisco, they didn't. Uh, um, implement it but they were discussing like the idea where if you leave jalisco to, to enter the state you had to have a vaccine certificate i'm like yeah are, it would have this would have been a fun yeah. time with me dealing with yeah. these cops because i would have been like i go to the beach i have a house in jalisco i'm mexican um you're not letting me go back into my house because i'm not vaccinated like this is absolutely crazy and then the, it's illegal to mandate covid vaccines uh, according to the state constitution of jalisco by the way, I, I laugh. What a joke. Uh, it's called the, the the sovereign and free state of Jalisco. That's what it's, it's, it's known as. I'm like, what a joke. They were discussing changing the state constitution of Jalisco to allow for mandatory injections. I mean, the, the, so when, when people talk about Mexico being some place to say from the end of the world, no, every country, all our politicians are captured like Enrique Alfaro, uh, you know, any other uh, Samuel Garcia, name any governor, you know, so. Yeah, well, uh, is Jalisco the second most populated state in Mexico? Pro- I, I I would wager they say Guadalajara is the second biggest city and then Monterrey. Yeah. So. Well, it also has Puerto Vallarta and other things. I mean, it goes out to the ocean. I mean, obviously, Mexico City is, uh, but I have to look that up. I know it's it's got a lot of people, though. But yeah, that, and that's and, and the population centers have always been more dangerous than the smaller towns. But but uh, you know, I went down to Guadalajara in September 2020 and did not have much, really have much hassle, other than the occasional public locations. I mean, well, the masks you couldn't get course, anywhere with masks. And of course, you could still you could still get in and out of Mexico. Thank goodness that was yeah. You didn't need, well, you didn't need PCR tests or vaccines yeah. to get into Mexico, but every establishment required masks. Yeah. And if you even like, if you wouldn't put hand gel on, they wouldn't let you in. So yeah, you know it's interesting. In in twenty twenty one, in in August and September of twenty twenty one, the worst place in Texas to be for all the COVID nonsense was probably, at least as far as I saw, was Laredo, because it was getting all this craziness from Mexico coming across. Uh, it was actually worse than the city, so where they were all. Nuts about uh, Mexicans were submissive. They were masking up yeah. like crazy uh, and getting injected. So yeah, that was that. Cool. That unfortunately seems to be the case in most of Latin America, because it's just kind of always been that way. Yeah, this submissive attitude. I was telling like Mexicans, I'm like, where's this revolutionary spirit, Zapata, Pancho Villa? No, you're all capitulating, submitting to tyranny. Where's this? No, it's like, what a joke, you know? And I don't know, it's because they've lived under empire for so long, Spanish empire, uh, and now American empire. And they don't, you know, for some of us, like myself, European, who have a memory, closer memory of communism and Nazism and fascism, we could recognize the tyranny instantly. Here, not so much. Yeah, I, I don't know what to think about this entire planet after coronavirus. I, re- I really don't. Uh, it just seems like it's a... I, I just look at what happened and say, what does this say about the 8 million on this earth? And what 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 is wrong? It's... I... And it's really scary to think about... Uh, I do think that maybe a minority enough got woke up to maybe that won't be possible again, but I, it's hard to say really, you know, uh, you, you were, you, you spent time going back and forth with Croatia. When, when was the first time you went to Croatia and when do you think that, what did you think about, you know, what happened there in the nineties with the war with Yugoslavia and Bosnia and all these other places? 
I mean, I, I went as a kid in the 80s. Uh, I, I went in the 80s, 90s. Uh, we moved to Croatia twice in the 90s. I was, I think, 10 years old or something. In, the, in 1994, towards the tail end of the war, I was in splits. Uh, but I didn't really experience the war because the Serbs had not gone. They, they only went, I think, well, like one third in to Croatia. So where I was in splits, uh, they hadn't gotten into. But I mean, they were not far. So I didn't really, exp you know, we were still able to come and go in Croatia during the war. Um, so, yeah, I didn't quite experience it. But it's a difficult thing to figure out, even for us. Uh, I think there were foreign imperial elements you know there's a S serbian made serbian biased film which is worth watching weight of chains by boris malagurski i think he makes some good points so i think there was you know the russians and the chinese you read some of their white papers from the 90s the chinese believe yugoslavia was you know a british european american uh project i forget what they say why um sort of in preparation of further wars that they were going to carry out against uh, other countries. Uh, and and, and um, I think that's one element. But then, of course, you had the organic local, you know, Croat Serb uh, elements. You know, people talk about this desire by Serbs for greater Serbia. People also talk about Tujman and this some machinations for greater Croatia. So there are these different moving parts um i haven't done enough of a deep dive to really you know figure out what went on but i think there were elements of all of these different things going on well it seems like to me there have been a lot of there's been a lot of animosities there possibly i mean at you look at back at some of the divisions in world war ii uh it was very it was very bloody what happened there in fact Hitler going into Yugoslavia might might have been even dumber than him going into Russia because you don't you don't want to go into there because those people like because it seems like everybody there likes to fight. <laughs> well, my my uh, Hitler going yeah. into Yugoslavia, Croatia from 1941 to 1944 was a Croatian Nazi state. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what the older generations tell me is. Uh, well, for example, my grandfather was for six months kept in difficult conditions he was a prisoner of the nazi croatian uh regime he was survived, he was he a serb or what was, what was no, the croatian my gro croatian grandfather was oh. a prisoner of the nazi croatian regime but he, in but the he 40s wasn't, but he just wasn't a nazi i guess so yeah no i mean just because the that doesn't mean all, like all, not all, yeah. not all croatians were nazis just the regime because they collaborated with hitler uh and so yeah yeah well, well, you, you know, it's really, it's, I, I, Yugoslavia just seemed like it was a really a manufactured country anyway. I mean, there wasn't yeah. really any reason for it to exist at all, but they just decided to put all these, put all these different groups together in one country. I guess they, I guess they thought it would be easier, harder for people to attack it if they were all, but they, but it was never really a country. It was always the Slovenes, the Croats, the Serbs, the. Yeah, we each had our own, you know historical geographic yeah. locations and they were yeah. bunched together but we've always lived under empire you know now we're living under euro slavia yeah. the fascist european union uh and then there was yugoslavia and then yeah. there was nazi croatia and then there was the kingdom of the slovenes croats etc and then the yeah. austro hungarian um, uh, empire yeah and the holy roman empire and the roman empire so we've always well. lived under, we've been subjects well, yeah. of empire and the balkan the balkans has always been this place where various empires would go to fight you know the, the, the empire, would go to fight right? the turks the turks would go there to fight the russians uh the austrians might fight the russians there and it was just a you know it was just kind of a place in the middle it's like okay don't people live here so you end up playing off different sides but of course the uh you know and of course russia russia and serbia use the cyrillic alphabet so that seems and to the maybe it's because they're right. because they're orthodox. Maybe that's because that also creates an alliance and Slovenes and Croats being mostly Catholic, uh, you know, and that was one thing I forgot to ask you about. What was the general makeup of religion in Kazakhstan? 
Kazakhstan. Um, is it Muslim, cat, Christian, or majority? Catholic? I guess Kazakhs are mostly culturally, not no, nominally culturally Muslim, not really practicing. Okay. Um, and the Russians, again, nominally, um, I guess Orthodox Russian. But Orthodox. we we were attending a, you know, Baptist Christian evangelical like um, church. Because we're, we're we're Christian, and so most of the people in the church were Russian, um, elderly Russian, like one or two Kazakhs. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so you know, you know, we should get back to this topic of the color revolutions. Do you think some of these people are just uh, they really do have their country's best interests at heart, and they're just taking the money because it's offered, or do you think some of them really are puppets? Because some because a lot of people have taken money from America and then just did whatever they wanted anyway. I think it's a mixed bag. I think some of the more the, the younger folks, like yeah. teenagers, twenty or you know, university like students, they've drunk the Kool Aid. Like the student that yeah. came up to me, high school kid, uh, that student, and you know, every everyone can complain about their own. The government there every government's doing stupid insane authoritarian things this is one thing i don't get about these westerners who are what the who are literally 100 percent pro bricks pro multipolarity the pro russia pro china china never ever does anything wrong or russia and i'm like oh, yeah are you nuts i can't shut up about yeah. complaining about mexico and croatia and america yeah uh, and you think russia xi jinping is some god yeah. give me a break uh, there's, yes there's tyranny in china there's tyranny in russia there's tyranny in mexico there's tyranny in america so that doesn't make sense some of these people yeah. gotta be getting paid off or something but back to kazakhstan so that young kazakh uh was hated her the, her government um had good reasons for doing so and so then it's like the grass is greener on the other side so she thought yeah we want the western model pro democracy blah 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 so some of these young people in those target countries they really believe it they drink the kool-aid but i think then the older people i mean you can't be that stupid one example for me would be svetlana you know in belarus the svetlana lady who wants to r remove um, lukashenko and she's completely financed by the west for me yeah. someone she's like a total puppet and I think she yeah. must know that she's a total puppet and she's a total traitor because she's in the pocket of Brussels, Washington and London. And she, you know, she wants to take over. She wants to be regime change. Lukashenko be put into power yeah. in Belarus and then she'll do whatever uh, Brussels, Washington and London say. How is that, you know, being a good Bella, you know, a patriotic Belarus? Well, well, every every revolutionary has to pay his bill some way. And, and there's not and, you know, most revolutionaries don't get rich. I mean, I mean, if you're born into money like bin Laden, but, but otherwise, you know, it's a, you oh, got, look at you've got to kind of take the money from whoever, whoever look at the case of Imran you. Han though. Yeah, yeah, I would count Imran Han as yeah. in Pakistan of a true patriot yeah. revolutionary. He's willing to lay his life down for the sovereignty of his country. Yeah. Uh, you know, compare some Imran Han to some loser like the Svetlana in, in Belarus, who's a yeah. total sellout, uh, Going to sell out her country to the West. That uh, I mean, it's a complete joke. I I, I want to vomit when I see these people like Svetlana and the Western liberals that support, uh, you know, these sorts of regime changes. Well, I don't. You know, I, I have mixed feelings on Lukashenko because it sounds like he's a dictator, but but to his credit, he also completely laughed at all the coronavirus nonsense, uh, probably more than anybody in Europe. So it's like okay. Uh, well, at least he at least he cared enough about his people to do that, whereas all these other countries completely bought into this nonsense. I mean, but again, I, I you know, I've yeah, I don't, I don't know much about Svetlana. I, I want to see free societies. I but, you know, I, so it's really hard to tell. I mean, you know, the, you know, the American revolutionaries took, you know, took help from the French, not because they wanted to do what France told them to do, but just because, hey, that's help. And France wanted to humiliate England and France did. Yeah, but this, in the context of what we're discussing, this help, yeah. this money comes with strings attached. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, the people who became the Taliban and bin Laden took money from Americans back in the 80s. And it's like, oh, thank you, Americans. It's like, oh, guess what? 
we're doing our own thing now. But it, it, it becomes, well, as you say, I mean, I, I think there are different, a few points here. When you say uh, Belarus and Lukashenko dictatorship, um, I think that's thrown around too easily by these globalist Western liberals. Yeah. You know, go to Belarus, live as a Belarusian, see what locals think, um, number one. So I, I don't like to throw that term around. I was reading Blinken's speech yesterday. And, and and what a joke. He's talking about freedom and democracy and accusing all these other countries of authoritarianism. And I'm like, I actually quote tweeted. I said, yeah. this literally de describes as America. What freedom and democracy when America is debanking and deplatforming people like us. Yeah, these, and, uh, I, and, it's, it's all and labeling right us as domestic terrorists. I'm like, you it's, it's, freaks. I know it, it's completely hollow. And I don't I don't think anybody believes it anymore. And, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's also that term, you know, that Gonzalo Lira used when he called it rainbow imperialism. Or uh, Jim Jatris, who calls it rain also you know, rainbow let's, fascism. You know, let's, let's go, you know, oh, oh, you know, uh, oh, it's so horrible that Russian males have to use the men's room and Russian females have to use the women's room. We better we better go and go over there and fix that. You know, yeah, rainbow, like, rainbow fascism. State yeah, Department rain, finances, rain, all may, of that. Maybe rainbow fascism is a better, yeah, rainbow yeah, imperialism, yeah. rainbow fascism. Yeah, that's but, but, but My second point, though, using Kazakhstan as the example, though, when I was in Kazakhstan, they uh, frequently on weekends shut off big tech, you know, Instagram, WhatsApp, because people would sometimes gather to protest. So they'd shut that off. Even the internet, um, my e private email is banned uh, in Kazakhstan and Russia. I had to go through three VPNs. They kept blocking VPNs in Kazakhstan. And at one point, they tried to force the entire nation of Kazakhs to install spyware, to in install bro a browser certificate in you know, Mozilla and Google Chrome, which would then allow the Kazakh government to see, they could see your usernames, your passwords that you log into, everything. And Mozilla and all the browser companies like block that. That's absolutely insane. That tells you what the Kazakh government was trying to do, which is insane. But another point is, it's you're between you're, you're stuck with two bad options. You know what I'm saying? Like Lukashenko or Svetlana. So it's, it's not as that simple because if you're the Kazakh government, you still have to protect yourself from the empire trying to overthrow you. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So Internet censorship sucks. But at the same time, your country is under attack and you kind of have to censor to protect yourself from that attack. So it's like you're it's between a rock and a hard place. I, I don't know. What, what do you do in that situation? Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, it's it's not a good situation. That's why some, I, you know, I, I, you know, I've I've known that there are some libertarians who have gotten awards from the National Endowment for Democracy, and I I don't, you know, I I don't want, you know, and maybe they're just people who are looking for help, you know, because as a libertarian, I know, I know, I know, libertarians are not making money anywhere. They're, you know, they're not they're not getting rich. You know, it's, huh. uh, you know, you got to take the donations. It's like, yeah, well. Taking donations is one thing. It doesn't mean you, you know, you're necessarily taking orders. You know, it's, you know, just like when I, you know, when I give money to street musicians, I don't ask, them, I don't, you know, they don't change their songs. They just keep playing. Yeah, but I would assume with like National Endowment, they say, you know, yeah. we're going to give you this money, but you got to tweak, do, do these things. And then, of course, they won't continue to give you money unless you do what they say. I personally would never touch anything from something like <laughs> NED or Open Society or USAID or whatever. Yeah, I agree. You know, that you know, that's uh, they talk about Vivek Ramaswamy. I mean, he apparently had a Soros scholarship years ago. I, if that that was 20, but that, but if that was twenty years, but if that was a long time ago, it's like okay, it was I, a scholarship. I, well, I don't, I don't. He trust might have been a guy. dumb kid, you know. It's, he had a biotech company that was profiting, participating yeah. in the COVID narrative, and then most yeah. recently, he says a lot of good things. You can say ninety percent good things, but if you there's this one key, you know, poison that you're peddling. I think he somewhere yeah. said that we need to mandate digital ID. So I don't care. He can say 99% of things that are wonderful. If digital ID is mandated, this is Aldo Huxley's, what he said, the final revolution. Yeah. We're dead. We are completely dead. It's totalitarianism. They can then shut us off. I can't buy food because of digital ID. I, think, I know think what you you're saying. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I know what you're saying exactly. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if some you know these ro rose revolutions could go either way. It's really hard to say uh, who the good guys or who the you know who's who's taking money from whom. I think, and I, yeah. So, uh, 
You know, uh, I got, got to ask you too, uh, what, what do you think about the whole situation in the Caucasus region? Um, you mean like... Uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, other other various disagreements there. Uh, I haven't focused in on, on it so much. I think over the years I've had maybe one or two guests cover it. It seems like Russia is losing its uh, influence. Um, I mean, there's a lot of actors there. Turkey is in there. Israel, um, they want to use that as a possible front against Iran. Um, Russia seems to be losing influence. The CSTO, you know, Russia's NATO just doesn't seem to be functioning. Nobody cares about it. None of the countries are participating in it. Russia did not come to defend the countries there uh, when they were supposed to. It shows weakness. Uh, so I, I definitely could see uh, things flaring up uh, again there. Yes, things could flare up again there. Yeah. Well, right now you've got that whole situation with uh, Nurgan or Karabakh. And uh, looks like Azerbaijan is doing a starvation blockade, uh, which uh, basically is a genocide, but can't get food out and they won't let them out. So it's uh, not a good situation. But yeah. Wondered, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're in Mexico. Have you been to the rest of uh, Central and South America? And I got to ask, what do you think about Javier Mille? Oh, well, yeah, I've only been to Costa Rica, I think. Um, yeah. But I, I noticed you've done a whole series on that. I you know, I haven't even had time to watch the Tucker interview. Is it out yet with, with Mille? I don't know if Tucker's interview is out. I, I've not interviewed Mille, but I've now done 11 shows where we're talking in English with people about Mille and... Uh, People who have been all people who speak Spanish and uh, know more about Mille than I do. So. Yeah, I, I don't have enough of an informed opinion on Argentina or Mille. In in some ways, it sounds cool. It's like taking a wrecking ball to the system, which is pretty cool, you know. Um, but I, I've I've picked up just a few comments here and there from Daniel McAdams of of Ron Paul Institute. He commented on his Twitter that he thinks, you know, Millet is like a CIA stooge or asset somehow. And others who've commented that, you know, he's very close to the Washington establishment. So, again, it's like kind of what we were saying earlier between a rock and a hard place to they want to dollarize the economy. That could be good in, in practical terms. But then again, it could also be serving American empire uh, interests. Again, it's it, between a rock and a hard place. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, now, it's so like the people of Argentina have to make practical decisions in terms of survival. That comes first. Yes. You know, beyond like the the you know intentions of the empire. Yeah. Well, and you know, well, it, you know, granted, the dollar is a fiat currency, but it's a it's not as bad as most of the other currencies in the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And you know, it, it's it's nice to see someone come along and shake things up. So why not? You know, let's let's throw in a, a firebrand, you know. Yeah, and it's it's also a question, you know, you know, often libertarians have been the useful idiots for the bad guys. Maybe the libertarians can turn the bad guys into our our own useful idiots. You know, it's uh you know I mean, it's just yeah. Let's experiment, you know, with uh let's bring in this uh, Radical ideas, yeah. but antithetical to this this insane, you know, not not radical in the Marxist, yeah. communist collective sense, but anything radical uh, opposing <laughs> collectivism. The the word radical comes from the word root, which just means you're going to the root of the problem when you're a radical. A radical is a person who doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to prune the trees. The radical wants to cut down the tree and dig up the roots so it doesn't grow back. Yeah. That's, but, that's uh, the but, difference. And that's often what, and that's what you have to do with government agencies. Oh, we're going to cut this agency's budget by 50%. Well, guess what happens in four or five years? Comes back. The budget is back to where it was. That happens so many times. Oh, we better, we better completely cut this agency out and fire everybody. Although you know, I could see chance the agency might not come back. You just g gave me uh, another scenario idea because where the globalists 
where a lot of them are based in the Western Empire and American Empire, you, you, one of their goals is to install technocracy or algocracy rule by algorithm, scientific dictatorship rule by algocracy, AI. Yes, algocracy rule by AI and software. So they want to eliminate politicians, human politicians. Um, this is their goal. It's in their white papers. And so they want to get rid of politicians. So if you look at it this way, that could lead in towards their favor where Millet abolishes these uh, all of these different government agencies and institutions. He could also be paving the way for <laughs> pre precisely technocracy. Uh, you know, that's something we would see in a few years if you think about it. So, again, these people work, work with long term projects. So in the, in the near term, it might sound great, fantastic. But then when you realize their long term game is to might be to do something like technocracy, then like, OK, we're, that's very bad. Um, and, and just one more point on Latin America. My biggest concern right now is this push towards supranational globalist regional integration on the EU model. I've been talking for the last year. AMLO of Mexico, he's literally been saying we should copy the EU and make a North American union. Bukele of El Salvador a month ago said the same thing. He said literally, he literally said we should copy the EU and make a Central American union, unify all seven, seven Central American countries, create an open borders community. And then you've got many of the Latin American leaders like Rafael Correa, uh, Lula and, and Boric, Croatian, yes. Chilean, Marxist saying we should we should create a South American Union based on the EU. So most of our leaders are wittingly or unwittingly working towards globalism. <laughs> yes, the globalists are definitely doing interesting things. You know, I'm, that's uh, going to be very interesting. I, I I don't know where you know where these people, where their friends are. Daniel, yeah. And, and I don't know, I, I don't know what McAdams knows. I, but the first question I'm asking myself is, does it, you know, I'd ask Daniel, do you, do you speak and read Spanish? But if he, if he doesn't, I don't know how much, I, I don't know how much of an expert he can be. Yeah. I mean, there, there are other, um, like, yeah. you know, I've had on my um, podcast, yeah. for example, Emmanuel Rincon, who's from Venezuela, who now lives in, in, in uh, Florida, who also speaks English. He's got a huge following. Uh, right. He's very anti-socialist, anti-communist. And, and, you know, just reading his Twitter feed, uh, you know, I think he supports very much uh, Millet, for example. So, Emmanuel Rincon. Rincon, R-I-N-C-O-N. Yes, E-M-A-N-U-E-L. Emmanuel, two M's. Quite a f two M's, okay. There's on Twitter, he should, he should pop up. He's got like a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. There's a there's a lot of uh, okay. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of. I can give you his Twitter. People, yeah, I think I found him. Uh, Emma, you know, a double double that. consonants. A, a double M doesn't happen in Spanish very often. It's almost always single consonants. That's what. That's one thing I found interesting. But anyway, you don't really see a double M very much in Spanish. It's usually yeah. Emmanuel Rincon, yeah, that's uh, might be might be worth talking to. Yes, there's there's a lot of people out there talking to. I I had one guy on who's a who's actually American. I had two Americans who were down there, and one's volunteering for him. So that was a interesting perspective, not just to get the perspective on the liberty movements, but it's uh, going to be very interesting. You know, I think you know you've certainly done well with regard to this. You have American citizenship, Mexican citizenship, and Croatian citizenship, and I think that's. Uh, uh, a good, good, good diversification. Hey, you know, international man, Doug Casey, he's been on my uh, program. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to uh, escape COVID-1984 uh, in Kazakhstan if it wasn't for my second passport, the Croatian, because they weren't letting uh, it took us five days to get back to Mexico. And they were not you. EU was not letting third country nationals, I guess, into EU. But because I had a Croatian passport, I was able to get, you know, into Amsterdam and back to Mexico City. And even though my family doesn't have uh, that passport, uh, because they're my family, they were able to go with me as well, according to the EU's own rules. So, you know, it's, yeah. good, it's good to have options. And this this is another reason why I, I don't see how anybody can call themselves a libertarian and then 
say, oh, I want to put up the border wall. Oh, yeah, that's, you know, you know how that's going to be used. Against us. Against everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you've had a very interesting selection of guests on your show. Uh, it's a and very uh, in a very interesting world we live in nowadays. I, 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 you know, I, I, I I've often said this. I think sometimes me, I've said that melee could be the most important election in the history of the world, and I, it, it, and and if it works out, it might very well be. I, I think it could, but yeah, there are things that could go wrong here too. It's. It could be, but I think uh, I kind of don't. I'm not interested anymore in, in voting or elections because I think yeah. the global globalists control everything now, uh, everywhere. I mean, just COVID kind of showed that. Uh, I did have a great yeah. guest on. You should get him on, John Rubino, uh, economic analyst. Uh, and I interviewed him in 2020, right before the election with Trump, and he said something a lot of probably a lot of people probably disliked him for saying that was that this will be the least important election. And he was talking about the Trump, uh, uh, Biden election 2020. And I think it turned out in some ways, you know, he, he did have a good, he did have a point, you know, not much. Well, the Biden regime uh, sort of, sort of sucks horrible. Well, that's, well, well, every, every election in America, you know, I, I've heard that every election in during my lifetime has been the most important election in our lifetimes. You know, it's just like every, you know, every two or three, you know, you know, two or three times in NFL season, you'll hear, you know, about this is the game of the century coming up. I mean, we, we've got a uniparty. So it's like either way, they're going to push this police surveillance state. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I'm curious. Did you ever read the Kaczynski manifesto? No, but I've been meaning to. I've, I've seen uh, snippets people post. Uh, of course, uh, what do you... <laughs> We, we live in this totalitarian age where you have to put this disclaimer so the DHS, which is listening, doesn't say, oh, you're a domestic terrorist. It's like, of yes. course, we write off the crazy things that Kaczynski yeah. did and don't bomb people, don't do anything violent. Well, but if you read some of his analysis, he was on point. And uh, maybe this is something I learned a long time ago. The analysis is not necessarily the person. The, the statements are not necessarily the person. I mean, if, if Kaczynski tells me that two plus two equals four, I'm not going to say, well, no, it doesn't. I'm going to, I'm going to look at that information, look at that statement and judge the statement based on what it says. And yes, two plus two does equal four. It, it, you know, so, and certainly I, you know, you know, and it's unfortunate he didn't put that out in the air of Substack or something, but you know, it's a, yeah, it's a, I think it is worth a read. It, it has some analysis. There's a lot of things out there too that, you know, if you read read some of the books, whether it be Brave New World or Fahrenheit 451, or and also, you know, check check out the movie Network, which is not necessarily portrayed as a dystopian movie, but oh, geez, great movie, yeah, uh, amazing movie for night for 1976. It was so pre-signed in so many ways. Uh, there's there's a lot of things you just need to look at before. It's, uh, you know, I I don't want to be. I think we can sometimes get too much of an, you know, the, I don't know if taking the cyanide pill is the right way to go though. It's uh cause I, I think you, you kind of just give up instead of look for possibilities. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, 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 I'm very, the, they say in the Balkans, we have a dark, dark humor. Yeah. Uh, so that's one way. Um, I, I am cyanide pilled on this material plane. Uh, but I am white pill, you know, because I, I I am Christian. I do believe in God and and eternity and the afterlife, and so that's how I kind of argue. Um, I kind of feel that yeah. history is winding down. You know, I believe in the prophecy that there's going to be a one world government and um, Christ will eventually yeah. return. So that's my white pill. So people don't get me yeah. wrong. I am both cyanide pilled, but I have my white pill. Uh, and so, are, are you still Catholic or? No, I'm, 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 I just like to say non denomination Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure. You know, there, I know some Christians are getting, or so I know some people used to call themselves atheists. Now they're into orthodoxy and it's very interesting to see how this. A is number going. of libertarians, you know, Mark yeah. Blair, Buck yeah. Johnson, who I ran into last month in Texas, yeah. they're, you know, they've gone into orthodoxy. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't have, I have, I don't have a lot. There's, you know, there's a guy like Buck. I don't always agree with Buck, but, 
I, I see, I still see a guy who has a sincere and passionate interest in ideas. So that's a guy I, I you know, I'm cool with sitting down and having a pizza with him and talking and talking stuff for two or three hours, just because I know he's interested in ideas. I'm interested in ideas. And that, those are the kind of people you, you know, whether or not they agree with you, you're going to walk away learning something from people like that. I, Buck, Buck's a good guy. Yeah. I, I, Mark Claire's a good guy too. Yeah. He's, Hey, I've sat down yeah. with Marxists and yeah. broken bread with them who oh, tell yeah. me, you know, if we were in power, I'd be sending you to the gulag. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you like Mexico, obviously. Do you think that's the best place to be or, or is there any other place? You I think don't think there be? is any best place to yeah. be. I think for, you know, for you, anyone listening, like there's a bet, whatever is the best place for you. Um, it's just a multitude of, of factors. And yeah. I have just this attitude. I have this spaghetti. I love the spaghetti westerns, you know, Clint Eastwood and all of the others. Uh, I've just got this spaghetti western, John Bon Jovi, Young Guns 2, Kiefer Sutherland, Blaze of Glory mentality where, like, I'm going to make my you – make, you make your last stand wherever you are. And just, I just happen to be in Mexico. I'm tired of travel. You know, I, I'd also love to go back to Croatia. But uh, there, I don't think there's any – it it's just depends on you as the person. You know, I had a recent podcast guest, yeah. David Skripats, former Canadian Forces veteran. He wrote this masterful piece detailing how his parents fled Yugoslavia in the 50s when it was dangerous. They risked their lives and they escaped. And that his father yeah. told him, like, uh, with the COVID stuff, there's no point to escape. There's nowhere to escape to. So because COVID showed us that, you know, if, if you're living in Canada now or, or Croatia or Mexico, just stay there because there's nowhere to escape to because when this happens again, all governments will do the same thing. So you might as well just bat down the hatches wherever you are. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know, you have more and more of these libertarians who are just, you know, I call them the head for the hills libertarians. They're just, you know, saying, okay, they're dropping out. I'm going to start growing my own food. And, I mean, I, I would, and I'm, I'm cool. Too. I'm cool with them doing that. Although it's not really how I want to live. I, but I, but I, but I support them. I, I mean, I, if you can, I I, 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 I definitely would go rural. Uh, or, I mean, there are places where you can go rural where you're close to the city. So you're yeah. kind of like suburban rural where you could have a farm and all that, but be also close to, you know. And, you know, I, I've got a Starlink right here. It's my plan yeah. B. I could literally go in the mountains in um, Mexico and still be doing what we're doing. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. I, I also think there's, you know, and this is something that could cause a long debate. You know, you have some preppers who say, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm always going to have enough supplies to last me for six months or, and I think you probably need to make yourself where you can be as flexible as possible so that if you need to pack up and get out of Dodge, you can pack up and get out of Dodge. And, and if you're, and, and, and if you have six months of supplies, you, you're going to, you're going to have to leave those supplies. So it's really a tough call, which, which you want to do. It's a, uh, but in some history shows us that a lot of pe more people have lived the other way, but we're also a lot more poor and we're a lot richer now and we're able to accumulate stuff. But yeah, I think it's, I think the most important is community and uh, yeah. network uh, where you are. And as well as you say, being able to uh, escape. I mean, how many times have we seen world war two, two history people have had to flee Um so I don't, I personally wouldn't, I definitely, even here in Mexico, given how, you know, with the narcos and everything, it really doesn't make sense to build, you know, invest in some bunker compound where, um, you know, you can just, it's a numbers game. You'll easily have a hundred narcos come and take you out done. You know, you had the Mormons in North Texas that happened to them. They had this compound, these Mormons in North, uh, North Mexico. Um, they got, you know, some of these, some of the, some of these groups, you, you might it might shock you, even though they claim to be anti-government. But then you look into them, they realize, oh, wait a minute, they're taking a bunch of handouts here, like like the Montana Freeman taking farm subsidies. It's it, it, it some of them aren't always so innocent, but but some are. I I, I will agree. It's uh, hey, I mean, I wouldn't. I, I certainly was... think Randy Weaver. I met Randy Weaver once, and he was innocent. I mean, I I wouldn't, you know, by default negate taking yeah. certain um you know money from the government like i don't have any qualms when, for my undergraduate in illinois i i i applied and i got fafsa you know free money from the government for my bachelor's uh, degree uh and hey i've paid taxes you know that's something oh yeah 
in, in that context. In others, maybe I would not feel comfortable taking, for example, um, you know, f- food stamp money. I would rather work, want to pay my way, you know. And I've seen that abuse. I used to work in the supermarket, and so, yeah, yeah. Well, what do you, you think? We might be going into space pretty soon. Maybe that's our hope. I, I don't know. I don't think. We're, <laughs> I I think the other things are going on, and space is that that whole. Well, again, that goes back to what I'm saying earlier, and I've seen this written in their own papers. People who are you've got like a, what's it called? Democracy. I'm forgetting the name now. I think one of the key reasons for this whole space, uh, dreaming of space, is to, th- they need a way to unify mankind for world government. I, I read uh, a piece recently from one of these ideologues who said, you know, one of the reasons for the space race is to bring humanity together uh, so we can have world government. So I think part of the reason of all this yes. speech talk is, um, well, is to create this world, uh, one world culture. And I think some of the other stuff is to, to get financing for the space military industrial complex to create these technologies for control and uh surveillance so well uh, well uh, and i don't know about you but if it it, if it so happens that we get visitors from another planet and they might want to come and take over i I will definitely be collaborating with them because they're probably a lot smarter than what's running things here i mean i i would uh, initially i'd agree with you but uh i mean yeah yeah, i got a i got a eccentric view uh on that i don't believe in extra terrestrials i believe that the aliens yep. are actually fallen angels are angels you know from the bible who want it's to possible that they, they want to you know you've seen the movie prometheus it was a great yeah. movie but the the seed of thought the planting they want us to believe that we were created by physical alien beings not by god uh and so that you don't have to believe in god or jesus anymore it's aliens who well, created you when in reality they're not aliens there it's it's lucifer and the angels <laughs> that's my possibly. crazy theory but but when you consider the 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 number of stars in the, in the sky and the number of and that there are planets revolving around these stars uh you know there are there's obviously a lot of the planets are not would not be inhabitable by life as we know it but you have to wonder maybe there are some planets where life is where there where the, the, we could inhabit them i don't know yeah, I mean, I, I kind of take the view that I don't I don't necessarily have to believe yeah. that there has to be life. I, I will, God, I God created that. everything, and then um, he it's not doesn't mean that he created life uh, elsewhere. I'm completely content with believing that you know we are the only ones. Maybe he did, uh, but and maybe that's for some time in the future for us to, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You and know. I don't know if you, you ever read Graham Hancock. I've heard about him. I've never read him. Um, yeah, he has. He has a theory that there was a that there was an ancient civilization where the Amazon rainforest is now. And yeah, I mean, I, I can't that, really that, comment. That's the theory he has, and his theory is based partially on the fact that the Amazon rainforest is the only place where there hasn't been a lot of digging done. I mean, my only view would be that. Yeah. If it is the, any, I, I, I generally don't believe in that stuff. And, or, or if well, my version would be, if, if the ancient civilization would be the, I believe the, the, the Noah's flood actually happened and that the population before the flood, you know, that would be the ancient civilization. Maybe and so. I, I do believe in some of the funky stuff, you know, it says in Genesis well, that the oh. angels mated with uh, human women and Nephilim, these giants were yeah. a result. So, you know, well, I mean, what do you think, for example, about continental drift that we were all one big continent at once? Yeah, I think the flood, I think what we see now, the rivers and, and oceans is that's the water left over from the flood. I know it's something very to, possible. Uh, I, I, I think one thing that because because of how translation goes and when you have a Bible, when you have something that was written a thousand years ago in a different language, you know, it's it's going to, it's going to change over time, and you know, I, yeah. I, I, so for I example, I, I yeah. think that I think that explains, for example, why you have some of these people that they say, "Oh, he lived nine hundred years," and I, I, I suspect something got changed there, and they probably didn't live nine hundred years. But no, maybe, I, I do believe that maybe they, they lived nine hundred months. You know, no, I, I, I don't, I don't believe uh, that. Like twenty years ago, when yeah. I was really digging into this stuff, uh, I, you know, they found I, I've I've swam in the Dead Sea in Israel a couple years oh, back. Wow. And 
you know, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls that were uh, like 2,000 years yeah. old. And it, it's basically a copy of the Old Testament. And they compared it and it's the same. Nothing changed. And I've studied what you what you mentioned, the, the, the translation. Yeah. And pretty much everything has stayed the same. It's anything that was altered were, you know, commas or periods or articles like the or, or words that were inconsequential. And so I personally believe that the information is uh accurate that anything that was messed up w was not of consequence when it comes to you know doctrine or theology or whatever so i i don't have a hard time believing you know men lived 900 uh years and here's just one more interesting point yeah it says after the flood god god puts the limit to 120 years for man more or less right uh, and we see most people die you know people live to 100 110 120 uh there have been I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if we've seen anybody live to 120. We've definitely seen. No, I mean, you there, can was a, there was a there was a guy there was a guy like a, a few years ago who was like 113 who died in Austin, and, and because he was so because he was so old, it was it was big local news. They, they had his funeral on TV and everything. I mean, this guy had become a, a local celebrity just because he was so old. But but it's interesting that the Genesis says that uh, God puts the limit 120, and then there was a scientific article yeah. like Scientific American or something 10 years ago which said, you know, we can't understand why uh, there's a ceiling at a, around 115 years old. So you can be a uh, uh, fit 100-year-old, 105 years old, but it's, you know, we don't know what happens. As soon as the body gets close to 115 years, it just it starts decomposing and dies. Uh, so that, that kind of, that's interesting where you got a scientific article saying that there's some ceiling around this age <laughs> that's mentioned in Genesis, but uh, yeah. <laughs> According to Wikipedia, the oldest living person is 114 years old. Is it is an in Venezuela of all places? Uh, currently living, but the, uh, the oldest person ever actually did go to 122 in France. Uh, Jean Calment, uh, 1875 to 1997. Wow, that's a long. I, I don't know what you, what do you do with all that time? Isn't that just amazing? I mean, that's when you think about how long that is, it's just so, uh, you know, we never asked what, what do you, where do you think Russia and China are going to go in the future? Do you think uh, some people say China's a paper tiger? Others say it's going to last. I mean, you know, I don't know if, if, how much time you spent there, but you seem like you've been to a lot of different places and you get in touch with a lot of different people. So I, I, I don't know because I listen to smart people with different views that say China economically is not doing so good. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've interviewed Gregory Copley, who's interesting strategic studies association. Uh, you know, it, it could be that all countries are, are hit an economic, you know, we're all going to decline economically. So it's not just that, you know, if China's a paper tiger, so are we, we're, we're even worse, you know, if that's the case, uh, I'm not a big believer in bricks and multipolarity. I've got a thesis that again, the goal is world government. Um, a totalitarian world government and i see and others are agreeing with me that uh bricks is a move accelerating actually it's a head fake so it, it's actually a move towards world federation and world government and you know bricks was actually the brainchild of this indian world economic forum young global leader and goldman sachs uh banker and you look at the BRICS model, it includes technocracy. So really, and they double down on all of the globalist ideas of United Nations, sustainable development, agenda 2030, all of these, you know, and all this technocracy. So uh, I think it's just a step towards integrating the world towards a world totalitarian world government. And it's a key point. It's it's uh, for the Russians and the Chinese and the global South. It's their way of arguing for a better seat at the table of global governance. So it's not a new, it's not an alternative model. Even leftists that I've interviewed, Professor William William I. Robinson, who's like a hardcore communist socialist, whose work I respect and analysis, he came out and penned a piece recently saying the same thing. He's saying that the whole BRICS model is nothing different from the Davos West model that the, that the, it's that it's it's part of it's within the same global capitalist system the BRICS model 
So you've got, some, you know, I interviewed a Moldovan politician recently, Yuri Roshka, who was close, you know, to the Putin sphere, was friends with Alexander Dugin and Daria Dugin. Uh, they've since kind of uh, parted ways because Yuri says the same thing that I'm saying, that multipolarity is, it's, it's a globalist uh, project. So I don't know, I guess time will tell. We'll see. <laughs> It's almost like they're two two sides of the same coin, or you call it the Hegelian dialectic. Yes, it's uh, hard to say. I I just wonder, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, any place in Africa you think looks good, or you think Africa is going to still pretty much stay the same? Look, I read every day. I read biometricupdate.com stuff like that, and you just see every single country on the planet is doing this stuff. I'm reading in Rwanda, in Kenya, in all these different countries. The governments are making, bringing in digital ID and making it mandatory. One of the articles actually said in Rwanda that if you have digital ID that we're building out right now, that will give you access to public and private services, life services, they call it. If you don't, they literally imply in the article, if you don't have digital ID, you will not have access to life services, to public or private. And then the government can have the ability to shut off your digital ID. For me, that's like the book of Revelation that says, if you don't have the mark of the beast, whatever that is, uh, if you don't submit to the system, you cannot buy or sell. It doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if you're rich uh, or poor. We saw with COVID, you know, it didn't matter if you were rich yes. or poor. Um, so... In, in some, but I do think you know some of these developing countries, like continents like Africa or Latin America, might have you know one plus, one more plus than other parts of the world. So even though if yeah. they are bringing in these systems, it, it might be slightly easier to survive, you know, outside of these systems in like Africa, Latin America versus you know the global north. It's hard to say. It's a you know, there's also the possibility that America might get to some kind of moral high ground. You know, do you ever do you are you familiar with the uh, Strauss Howe generational theories? I've got the book somewhere behind me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, do you, I haven't read those, but I certainly hear about them. Do you have an opinion on those? You think they're I mean, I, I've it's not I mean, they're nonsense or, you know, they're not the only ones. I mean, I, you know, there's Peter Turchin, um, Neil Howe. Yeah. I've interviewed Johan Galtung. Um, who's in his 90s now? Um, yeah. Morris, Morris Berman, cultural historian. He lives down here in Mexico. He's got a trilogy on the collapse of American Empire. Uh, there's others. Um, what's this one called? Uh, uh, Fisher, the Great Wave. Um, Kondrat, Kondratri of uh, Cycle, Kondratri of Wave. So I think there definitely is There's something undeniable, scientifically speaking, to cycles. There's something very yeah. valuable in studying of that. So I think there's something there. But I don't think there's one theory that yeah. no one's got one theory that explains it all. So I think it's good to read all these different authors. They're onto something. There's a pattern, yeah. but there's really no formula because I think well, it, I think it carries many factors. I think it also carries a spiritual factor, which none of them take into account. Uh, you know, uh, and if a nation moves the further it moves away from, you know, principles of uh, biblical principles of morality. That's, you know, when, you know, supernaturally God can just, you can send a, I was reading this year that it's a, this year was, has been a record in America, United States, record number of climate disasters that have cost $57 billion. Um, uh, you know, John MacArthur, this well-known pastor in California who I listened to, he said that he thinks uh, um, God uh, has t moved his hand off of America and that it's we're experiencing the wrath of, of God. So I would factor that into the cycles as well of civilizations. But I think there is something to the fourth turning. Yeah. Well, it could just be that, the, you know, the cliche we often hear. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. And, you know, it just goes in this little cycle. Um, and maybe that's just what we're talking about. I, There's common sense to that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of truth that, you know, it makes me wonder what, what do you think about the whole state of, uh, gender, gender wars and stuff? I mean, I, I'm curious, what do you think about Andrew Tate, for example? 
I'm not a fan of Andrew Tate. Um, yeah. A lot of people have been taken in, but I think um, I, I've seen footage. People like there's this account Milk Bar TV, I think, on on, on Twitter. They've shown in his own words how he's um, he's not someone to be a role model. I mean, I've seen videos where he he says he's a Muslim. Yet he preaches so many things that are yeah. anti-Islamic. I, I know. I, I I sometimes wonder about that too. He's it's promoting, like you know, um, having I, sexual relations as a man with a transvestite with another man, homosexuality, basically. Um, and then, I didn't see that. But. Yeah, he said if there's a, a, a ugly biological woman, but a, a really pretty uh, man dressed up as a woman, like a trans, uh, yeah. you should have uh, relations with the trans man. Um, but you know the work the work that he's done has been so unethical with the webcams and the women and I don't see any reason to look up to Andrew Tate but a lot of conservatives I you know you're mixing well, you're poisoning the well so someone speaks like a lot of good stuff but then a lot of bad stuff as well and so you're just going to ignore I, the bad stuff and you know I I can say to his credit a, a lot of I didn't have any network that I follow where where the COVID narrative was more rejected than what I would call the, the manosphere. They, I mean, I mean, people like Tate were on the top of the set. This is baloney. We're, this is, we're not going to, you know, that you should shut down economies and stuff like that. It's just so ridiculous. Uh, you know, I. Yeah. I mean, of course. Yeah. He, he was on point on that, but in general, he's not, I, 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 I don't, you know, he's not a role model. Well, uh, I, I have, I, I seriously have to question the judgment of anybody who ever believed any of it. I mean, it's just, it just makes me wonder what, were they thinking? And and it's rather depressing to see a lot of people that I thought were good liberty activists buy into it. Uh, I mean, it was a tough one initially. Um, I can forgive people. I mean, I, I think at any point we can forgive. If people come out and say now, oh, oh I was duped at, at any point, you know, it's like, come here, give me a hug, you know. But, um, you know, in the first few months, it, it, it was a psychological operation. You know, one of the most sophisticated ever in human history. So, you got to hand it to them on 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 that. So, yeah, uh, I I do think it was a I, I do think it was absolutely brilliant in that sense. I I won't I won't I will give the devil his due. I it was one of the most brilliant psyops ever ever constructed. It got uh, I I don't know, and and libertarians seem to reject those kinds of methods, but the whole methods of psychological manipulation, it's as old as, as old as history. And it's, uh, it's how you get elected. It's how you get power. I don't favor, I don't favor doing anything using coercion, but if you can motivate them or inspire them or direct them, I think, or socially engineer them, I said, go right ahead. I, it's fine. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of, it's just like, you know, when you're trying to make, trying to sell a car or something like that. I mean, it's, and, and so, and so much of it is nonverbal. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's gestures, it's body language, it's voice tone, it's rising and falling, it's slowing, slowing down, speeding up. So much of it is that it's, it's not, you know, it's, <sighs> I don't know how you do that. I, I I wonder if Millet will serve as a blueprint for the libertarian world after this. It's uh, I hope he does. I we'll we'll find out. We're we're going to find out. I, I definitely. You know, I got to know uh, what do you think about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? My my thesis. I, I've had a thesis that hasn't changed. Um, some people, hey, you know, everyone's got their own opinions. Might be an unpopular opinion with the libertarian crowd, but. I have always from the get-go believed that Bitcoin has been like a globalist Trojan horse currency. Um, you know, you had the 1988 Economist cover where they said in 2018, um, you know, they had a phoenix standing on the ashes of fiat currencies and a, a new coin that looks very, very much like the Bitcoin symbol. And then you had the 1996 NSA MIT white paper on electronic currency and i've had great people on you know i always do devil's advocate you know mark yeftovich uh of serbian extraction canadian uh, easy dns bo a capitalist bomb thrower i've interviewed him many times um guy swan bitcoin expert um 
others I can't even remember. Paul Rosenberg, uh, cypherpunk, yes. uh, libertarian. He, I've interviewed him many times. You know, he disagrees with me, but my I mean, I'm holding to my thesis that I think Bitcoin and cryptos, the purpose was it was a globalist project because I think, well, number one, I think uh, not one person can just create this stuff. It takes like a team of resources. That's why I think like DARPA and the military, I think DARPA is one of the key globalist nodes. And, you know, DARPA created Facebook. They financed, uh, they basically created Google. Um, I'm pretty sure they probably, you know, Be Bezos is just the front man for Amazon. Uh, look at, you know, Elon Musk now on Twitter. I mean, that's basically being run behind the scenes and he's doing all the contracts for DARPA and Pentagon. Oh, so God. I think uh, that there are, these are all just fronts and behind you've got this like secret DARPA team. And so that's number one. Number two, I think you look at what happened. Bitcoin was kind of to whet the appetites for people. Yeah. You know, a lot of people got rich. It just got, you know, it, was, it created this bridge to wet appetites for digital money. And and then they bring in the CBDCs. So they you got to give something initially to people. So people people got rich, yeah. got a lot of money, and then the CBDCs come come in. That's sort of my take. I don't really dabble much in in, in Bitcoin uh, or crypto. I do take take donations, um, but that's yeah, that's my my theory yeah. because I think the goal is to bring in this algorithm ghetto cashless yeah. system. Yeah. So. I like this, the alg the algocracy. Yeah, you know, I remember, uh, you know, one of uh, another guy I sometimes follow posted this LinkedIn post from a girl, I think it was named Lacey K, and it said, another chapter begins. I, I I had such a great time working at at the FBI, and now I'm going to go to work for Google. I'm like, what? And granted, that's one example, but... I, I, I think sometimes Bitcoin is where all the libertarian techies are. They, they left all the other companies. Uh, it's, but yeah, but you see, like yeah. uh, many countries are, they're building out their CBDCs. Oh yes, uh, some of them on the foundations of crypto tech, like uh, Ethereum. I had Mark Yevtovich on again. The he, he's full on. You know, he's he's big on Bitcoin. Well, the, the, he told me that what some countries are going to do they're going to use the ethereum network as their foundation for their cbdc a week later literally the the norway central bank says hey we're going to use ethereum as the basis for our cbdc kazakhstan yeah. has been te testing out using i think like the binance or some other you know private crypto systems as the foundation for their cbdc so i mean whether wittingly or unwittingly bitcoin just, i mean they can just um cut off the mm -hmm. off ramps well now it seems like th they're trying to uh, one of the ex PayPal dudes, which PayPal is linked to the military industrial complex, he just came out and said, We're trying to, he said something along the lines this week that they're trying to make Bitcoin like the global money, which again, and that's going to connect to the CBDC system. So either way, Bitcoin is not going to save you because they're just going to integrate um, everything. I know some more technical guys are going to say, No, no, you, no, that's not true, but um, they're building this network where uh, of all the national you know central banks that will run their own cbdc's will interconnect and then that's going to connect with the private fintech sectors you know all the paypals and other payment systems that's all there that's everything's kind of like going to connect um together yes uh definitely it makes me wonder where things are going i i i i should point out a lot of bitcoiners do not like ethereum at all for the, some of the reasons you've stated no i'd agree i uh, i mean I would still say if I would have any crypto, it would be basically Bitcoin um, and, you know, maybe things like other people talk about. I don't have Monero, but, you know, probably. Yes, Monero. Like yes, there's a lot, a lot of stuff out there. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think this has been a really good discussion. Do you have anything else you want to say before we go? No, we've covered a lot. So, yeah, there's been a lot to cover. I, I, yeah, just uh, I knew you'd be a good conversation. You've it's so multilingual and so, uh, you know, yeah, it's a multi. I'm very multipolar and multilateral. Multi yeah, yeah, you've been around. It's a. It's always good to hear that. I well, uh, please like the video, subscribe, uh, follow the channel, uh, give it a thumbs up, and uh, go buy my novel, Escape from the Village. Check out my sub Substack. I'm Chris Baker. We're out.